money that I actually go to a binding degree or anything. So we realized we're going to have to put it together somehow. So this is loose stitching on tuition entry. Right? <laughs> 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 and I was thinking that that's the kind of guy tuition was that would make uh, a collating afternoon be something that you remember 30 years later. It's just like uh, he was that kind of guy, and we all got drunk, and I don't remember what, what happened later that night, but uh, I remember the early part was memorable anyway. Um, we're going to do a, a song that was inspired by John 30, about a little over 30 years ago, and that was back when we were all artists and, and writers and so on at, at the Gallery 53 on Williamson Street. Uh, and he used to refer to this great parade that would be going on all the time on Williamson Street with C.C. Riders and the winos and the poets and the artists and the musicians and everybody making this big circuit from Dolly's Restaurant to Denny's to the Crystal to the Jolly Tavern to the Wisconsin Inn and just always sort of this moving parade that he used to call the Williamson Street Shuffle. And so uh, I stole that title with his permission, of course, and, uh, and wrote a song that we haven't done in a long time, but uh, it's a song we used to do back then called The Williamson Street Shuffle, titled by John Tushin. <laughs> Do that again uh, today at, 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 at that 
the moment. But um, John's 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 passion um, is 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 part of all of us, and I'm I'm sure that uh, when we, we look around this room and the lack of pretense, we know that John did a very good job of selecting his friends. Jordan asked, some people didn't get the memo, I know that. Jordan asked that, that none of us were black. All of my pants are either black slacks or jeans. So it was a rather easy decision as to how to dress for this. Because other than a couple of, of erroneous instances during political campaigns, I can't think of a time in my entire life when I was in Tushin's presence that I didn't wear jeans. And that's certainly uh, what he would have preferred. Uh, I have to ask a question, because I'm going to probably embellish a little on history, and I've got to know how many people uh, know this. Tushin carried a small little clipping, a news clipping in his wallet for, for quite a number of years. Uh, took it out and showed it to people. Um, how many people here are, are familiar with that? Sonny, Jordan, that's all. So I can make this up as well as I want. <laughs> um, we, we, we can't seem to locate the clipping anymore. But basically, if you'd opened up the Capital Times sometime, I think it was in October of 1969, if you'd opened up the Capital Times, you would have found a short little article and it said that the police were called last night to a campus area apartment. When they arrived at the Mifflin Street address, they found a poet and a critic in a heated dispute. <laughs> um, the, the two roommates were having a disagreement over the virtues of the poem that one of them was insisting upon reciting. The matter was settled and police left with no arrests. Uh, that's, as far as I know, the first time that Tushin was published. <laughs> uh, in, 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 in a major local, local uh, venue. Fortunately, he was able to do a lot better than that as the years went by. And to share that with us are a number of people who worked with him very closely and very intimately over the years. Um, let me explain the confusion. Tushin's funeral, it should be that way. <laughs> um, I've been torn between whether or not I should make a all the statements or comments I have about him at this point, or do them during the course of the afternoon or the evening here. Uh, then there's a the question of introducing all these people. So I think what we'll do is, I'd like each person starting with, with Jane to come up here, spend a moment sharing with us uh, how they know Tushin, how they work with him, and then uh, sharing their, their tribute, their artistry, or in some cases, institutions with us. I'm not going to get up and down and, and introduce everyone. And then uh, maybe a little later, when it's time for the conclusion, uh, I'd like to just share a couple of more thoughts. So, Jane, there, there's one thing I do want to say. Um, I wasn't able to follow through with everything that uh, was necessary for this week, because we had uh, some other things in my family to deal with. There are so many people who step forward to help, help in so many different ways. And they're not all on this program, some of them are, but I know that Jordan and Sonny want to say thank you to all of you uh, for being here, for helping, and for sharing uh, your lives with, with Tushin. So, Jane Lynn? Oh, yes. 
For those of you who've got a copy of the program, at the very bottom, stories and reminiscing will continue after the service at the East Side Businessmen's Association, 3735 Monona Drive, it's that way. Uh, Budweiser is on tuition. <laughs> pay, pay back for all the six packs he borrowed from us all over the years. I'll be blunt about it. I don't think there's enough beer in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm one of the musicians who had the great honor to work with Tushin and know him. But I want to begin with something that uh, I picked up from Tushin. In his notebook when he would do readings, he had a sheet of paper that he copied several times and interspersed throughout the notebook as sort of a reminder to him. And it looked something like this. <laughs> it says, slow down, asshole. <laughs> Petrusha's worked with a lot of musicians over the years, and uh, musicians love to work with him. But one that stood out for Tushin was McCoy Tyner, a jazz pianist with uh, John Coltrane Quartet in the 60s, for those of you who don't know that. And apparently, Tushin said he went into a club and Tyner was in there doing a solo piano concert. And uh, Tushin was just really turned on by it, so he went up and introduced himself, and before he knew it, they were doing poetry and music together. And that was a real highlight for him. I think that was his favorite. Um, I've known of Tushin since the 70s. I've heard him work with a lot of musicians, friends of mine. Um, Joan Wildman definitely comes to mind. And someone Tushin and I often talked about. Now, I always wanted to work with him, but never really got to even meet him until about a year and a half ago. And uh, he called down at my radio show at Wart. And uh, got to talking and I said, you know, I've never actually met you, but I've always wanted to work with you. And he said, okay. <laughs> so, so we got together and that's when I really got to know him. And when I think of Tushin, I think of him as an artist and a friend of immense integrity and heart. And I have really had the honor and pleasure of performing with him only twice, last year in the spring, and then this year, on June 17th, was our last one. And it turns out that was Tushin's last performance. Um, by the way, he'd be really delighted to see you all here, because before we ever did a performance, he'd always say, well, you know, nobody's going to come. <laughs> oh, well, you know, but I've been handing out some poetry sheets the other day, and someone said they might come, so one person will show up. And that's what he'll say every time. So he'd be glad to see you all here. And since you're all here, um, what I'd like to do is share a couple of um, recordings that I have of Tushin with me. Um, they're both a little rough. In fact, uh, I've dealt with uh, equipment and recordings and things at our gigs before, at our performances. And he'd see me just going crazy with this, and he'd come over and take me aside and say, just let somebody else do it. Well, I had to do it. It's a little rough. Um, but then again, so is Tushin. So <laughs> I always felt Tushin was perfection in that sea of imperfection. So that's what you're going to hear. Uh, the first one is from the performance this summer. Uh, it's with me on piano and uh, Deidre Buckley on viola, who can't be here today. Um, this one's really for Tushin, because this was a piece that I wrote that he told me was his favorite. He just loved this piece. So I wanted to play this, but it's also with a reading of his poem, Montparnasse, which is in your program. It's a favorite of his and everyone's. Um, it's a good thing it's in your program because you can't hear his voice real clearly here. So you can kind of read along. The second poem is from a radio interview that uh, we were on with Stu Levitan last year to promote the first performance. 
And Stuart threw in my CD and just had it playing in the background while, uh, well, basically he egged Tushin on to just keep reading one poem after another and another, and of course he did. One of the poems he introduced as an especially significant one for him, and later he emailed me about it um, to explain that. And actually, that's the one that's on the board way in the back in between the two pictures. And if you look at those pictures again, the one on the left is from his last performance on June 17th. Um, and you can also <coughs> read the, the poem and what he said about it. But I would like to read what he said about it. The name of the poem is Finally Meeting Neruda in a Dream Real as Blue Dust. Did you remember what I said about Neruda's poem called Poetry? I swear that when I first heard it, I felt a sense of freedom, release, empathy, joy, sadness, and anxiety. Fuck, I wept. I found the fucking answer. Since I was a young boy, I knew I wanted to write, or had to write, and people, then and continuing, always fucking bugging me with why, how come? And I, with no answer, just feeling guilty, ashamed, never stupid, but embarrassed because I had no ticket, no answer to their meddling question. Now I do, and the cool thing is, I don't need to say a goddamn thing. Neruda gave me the answer, and I'm willing to share it with anybody seriously interested. Anyway, that poem to me was true liberation, and I'm not even a big fan of Neruda. I guess you really don't need a home to own a homing pigeon. And that was followed, as always, by his signature, and I just want to send it back to him today, Tushin, Peace and Poems. Here he is now.
through the blue dust of the Naruka moon. I have curled among the trappings of truth, whispered blade sharp through woodman's leaves of grass. I have lain warm wrapped and naked on the tongue of a blinking sun. And I need go no further into this galaxy, misunderstood by Philistines, crusaders, and the New York Mets. I am nothing now, nothing but rich blue dust, sparkling and radiant, filtering through the dead American night. I have uh, kind of two tasks today. One is to give you a memory of Tushin that after long thought I've selected. And another task is to deliver to you a, a tribute from uh, Reverend Dwight Lee Walter, AKA Hannibal Plath, who uh, Red was very active in, in the small press poetry movement and, and read often with me and Tushin in uh, late 60s and early 70s, hung out at the Fess Hotel and was very close to us. He desperately wanted to uh, come but was unable to because of uh, family tragedies, which would be clear in this note. But he wanted me to read uh, this email to you um, and then I have uh, some memories of my own that I would like to give you briefly. This is from uh, Hannibal Plath. Greetings, my name is, but was not always, Reverend Dwight Lee Walter. When I met John Tushin, my name was Hannibal Plath. I had changed my name in high school because I could not accept who I was or the mess of a family that I had been born into. When I met Tushin, all I had was a pseudonym, a love of poetry, and nice hair. <laughs> Tushin was an orphan by fate, and I was an orphan by design, hiding behind a fake name and a false self. Tushin was the first person to ever encounter me as a poet and an artist. Come to think of it, he was the first person to encourage me at all. Whether he intentionally did it or not, Tushin helped me to accept that a large part of my problem was that I was going nuts trying to conform myself to an insane world. Through him I learned the validity, indeed the dignity, of honoring my identity as an artist and, and to pay the piper in the coinage of poverty and poetry. He taught me that the muse, the goddess of poetry and song, was a fickle mistress who should not be abused. He taught me how to pace myself, how to accept rejection and indignity, and how to keep inspired so that I would not burn out like so many talented and yet fatally sensitive artists. Tushin and I formed a poetry publishing company together. Much of the impetus and the know-how was his. The highlight of our success was that we lost less money than other poetry publishers. <laughs> he told me that I was the very best poet in the Midwest, second only to him. <laughs> I think he told all the poets he encountered uh, of their greatness, second only to him. Tushin was a complicated and interesting man. He was a walking, talking, oxymoron. He was proof that fire and ice can coexist in the same place at the same time without diminishing each other. He was the stutterer, 
known for his oratorical skills. He was simultaneously inspired and depressed. He was immensely creative and sometimes destructive, especially to himself. He was the angry son of no one and the proud father of Jordan. He was part cactus and part daffodil. <laughs> he was so many other things to so many people, some of whom I assume you will hear from tonight. After decades apart, just a few months ago, he was quick to call me and offer me condolences when my precious six-year-old daughter was suddenly and tragically killed. He spoke to me not of death, not of the perversion of justice, but of the poet Rimbaud and his theory that each of the eight notes of an octave have a corresponding color. And somehow I, I was consoled Somehow I found rest in his voice like mad Saul found rest in the music of young David. It has been three decades since my path crossed with Tushin, and yet can you hear the pulse in my prose? Tushin fanned the flames in me, and those flames, like the flame in you and the flame in Tushin, keep burning. Through decades of silence, his voice resonated inside of me, and so, in the depths of your loss and your grief, I beg you to mark this time of remembrance also as a time of celebration. The real shocker is not that Tushin died, but that he lived. So I refuse to say goodbye. That would be silly of me and would contradict everything that I know. All I can say to John Tushin is, thanks for all of it, and farewell for now, sweet prince, until we meet again. Shalom. Reverend Dwight Lee Walter, Spring Hill United Church of Christ, Spring Hill, Florida. <coughs> I had a real hard time figuring out what to talk about. Uh, there's so much to say about John, about reading with him and Hannibal and others during the small press, underground press movement in the late 60s and early 70s about living with John and other poets at the Fess Hotel, about uh, getting arrested with John for drunk and hitchhiking, <laughs> about so many things that we, that we did together, about how he inspired a generation of Madison poets, about, uh, about how he was known and respected by many famous poets, Ginsburg, Burroughs, Corso, Barker, and Ruth Stone all knew and honored him and loved his work. How he was an intellectable part of Madison's underground culture. But, you know, there's so much and, and there's so many stories and I suspect that many of you following me will speak about some of these matters. I've spoken about uh, I've written about uh, being with Tushin at the Fess Hotel and, and, and so many memories crowd in and, and want to speak, but I, I thought that what I would do is give you a rather unusual memoir that goes back a long time and it might be something that very few of you uh, remember. In 1969 or 70 was the first time I heard Tushin read and it was a I think it was 69, it was a very unusual circumstance. He was, uh, uh, he was working with Broom Street Theater at that time, uh, and I believe he was uh, starting to produce The Camel and the, Leopard, uh, and the Leopard and the Child at that time, and he was doing a, uh, he had written a play uh, that was uh, kind of a surreal verse play that he actually read at Broom Street Theater, this long-haired, stuttering kid. And I remember hearing this amazing uh, play, which consisted of a series of uh, surreal episodes uh, separated with the cawing of a crow. So you would hear him read one of these strange episodes on the surreal journey, and then there would be, he would say, caw, caw, Claw, and then he would take a breath, and he, we would launch into another one. And 
And I, I don't remember the whole thing. It was a really amazing play, and I, obviously a brilliant young man. But the, the scene, there was a scene that I remember in particular which just stuck with me. And, and uh, he was, there was a scene that I remember in particular in which he was falling or flying through a void, like Alice going down the rabbit hole. And as he fell or flew, he was infested with angels. He, he had angels in his ears, and angels in his hair, and angels in his pocket. And he couldn't get rid of them. They swarmed around him. And I, and I remember, I, and it, it always made me think of Walt Whitman talking about invisible beings in the air all around us that we know not of. And, you know, John and I are, are not church-going people uh, by any stretch of, of the normal imagination. But I remember having a conversation with John about how some of the forces of nature might have personality and some of them might be worth talking to now and then. And and I remember that I'm, I'm convinced that wherever John is heading now, that angels will naturally flock to him, fluttering out of the darkness uh, towards something bright. And I think that uh, those little winged critters hitchhiking in his pockets are in for a wonderful ride because I, th I think they're going somewhere fabulous maybe a great party on the Near East side I don't know uh, because I'm convinced that if anyone knows how to show a bunch of angels a, a really good time that would be John Tush thank you Musher, and I have the great honor of having Tushin choose me to be his successor. Of course, you know, second only to Tushin. <laughs> he he always he got to um, he chose me to be poet laureate, following him, and uh, he got to say on everything. Continued to you know hold on to that title of being Poet Laureate, because he'd say, John Tuchin, Madison's first Poet Laureate. <laughs> so nobody ever remembered that, that I was Poet Laureate um, until now, and you know, this is the sort of thing that um, a traditional Poet Laureate is supposed to do. They're supposed to produce a poem for an occasion, you know, in the, the history of poet laureates, they were often um, appointed as the court fawn or you know, that they're supposed to um, speak well of royalty. Um, so I have um, something that I wrote for Tushin, and I have a poem by Tushin that um, I'll do second, and Angela will come up and accompany the second one, the poem, My Tushin. But I wanted you all to know that it's out on the newsstands now. Go to any of the local bookstores that, that Tushin used to haunt and um, the co-ops, and you'll see Mobius, and it has in it Tushin's last published poem. Amen. So why daddy sitting there? <laughs> and if this doesn't make sense or I stutter, it's your fault. If I cry, it's your fault too. For Tushin, whose death is now part of our lives, August 11, 05. When the word 
came, the word as orgasm, the word as God power, the word as warning from the poet prophet about a change of venue and menu because what's served now will have to be what we've preserved of how fresh he was. We all said it was way too unexpected and expected because he was always at death's door. He and his poems haunted graveyards long before now, doing a cha-cha-cha with Mr. Skull and Sickle, a syncopated chase and reverse as he served up an ole, mole, chocolate sauce, all spicy and musty, and you better get it with gusto, no fusto with overdone effects, no procrustean conformity, but always bearing witness to political deformity and all the ways we didn't love ourselves enough to live with joy. On my 50th, he said, it's all right to talk back to the clock. And though he took a licking, he kept on ticking until now, until now. The inveterate poet priest who left the seminary, a secret I was never supposed to tell, to search for faith in human fallibility, told me we're each resplendent in our own way. I love that word and the way he used it, resplendent. And he said, yeah, I love it too. <laughs> but he could be petty as any lesser life form, saturated in alcohol and pain, yet could speak out rich in sagacity and generous understanding as he went round for round with Satan, crooned rockabye to the babies in limbo, tapped out tone poems for clarion trumpets, bending blue notes in the small hours. Who knew that this would be the last ride, the last reading, the last drink or cigarette he'd bum off of you? or the last argument that you wouldn't get to make up because he quarreled with everyone he knew. Who knew? Nonetheless, what a sweet soul he had. What a sweet soul he has for good now. This is Angela McJunkin, who um, played with Tushin on many occasions. And she's still playing with Tushin, only I'm doing the words. The neon arthritic. 
The neon arthritic today was incapable of grinning. They had pulled out his heart and threw it on a beach. The waves pushed in then pulled out. Nearby, he had heard there was a war going on. The gods were making a mockery of each other. As silence settled on countless futures and the wisdom of uncounted elders. The neon arthritic, once a believer in only rage and passion, wrapped his arms around nearness and with bravery he prayed State Associated Press and broadcast to all the way around Wisconsin so that every community that receives it had the opportunity to take note of this. Um, and I, one thing I've been thinking about it on a personal note, and I've known John for 35 years, um, was that the last time I saw him, he actually took a burden off me. So I will say what it was, and um, for your benefit as well, perhaps. And it was just, I saw him at the Cardinal, I think, and it was not long after my mother had died at age 95. She was a great creative spirit herself, a dancer, musician, teacher. And, um, but she was spent her last five years in a nursing home, and I really couldn't bear to go see her as often as I should have because she was so diminished. And, um, and I told John I was really feeling a lot of guilt about it, and he said, Oh, Ron, guilt is such a waste. <coughs> That's all I have to say, and I'd like to introduce Doug Moe of the Capital Times. Thanks, Ron. And uh, I won't, I don't want to just repeat what I wrote in my column this week about Tushin. Um, but uh, just briefly, I, my friendship actually, I knew him from the early 70s when we were both young writers and called to seminars at high schools to talk. And uh, as you can imagine, the high school students were just mesmerized by him. And, and I was somebody who had done a few freelance nonfiction pieces, you know, for, uh, so they didn't pay much attention to me. But I, I certainly knew who he was. and. Uh, it wasn't, though, until then, uh, when I started my newspaper column at the Capital Times in 97, that uh, a couple of years later, um, I had an occasion to uh, 
to remember Tushin and, and to go look in our newspaper files. The Thompson administration was looking for a poet laureate. And, and uh, immediately I thought of Tushin. He was one of the few I knew. And he looked like a poet, God knows, and acted like one. And, and the stuff of his I'd read I loved. And, but I honestly didn't know whether he was still alive or still around or anything. And I was pretty surprised to go into the newspaper clip file and see that uh, he hadn't been mentioned in the Madison paper in six, seven years. Um, I called Paul Soglin and, and Stu Levitan and found out that indeed he was alive and, and did, but did a column suggesting him as the poet laureate. Um, Tommy looked elsewhere, unsurprisingly. <laughs> but Tushin got in touch and uh, began a, uh, a, a short five, six year, uh, but pretty intense friendship that uh, meant the world to me. And uh, and when I looked today, at the, when I punched up our electronic clip file, I found that I had done, I'd mentioned 50 times <laughs> in the column in, uh, in these years, and uh, which I think was good for him, I hope so. Um, certainly it was good for me when you write six columns a week, having a uh, life force uh, like Tushin in your town is a good thing. Um, he would call often, he, most often when he was Maybe he liked something I wrote, but more often he was a little bit upset about something. And uh, I remember when, it, when he called, uh, when Rod McEwen come back, was coming back to Madison, and I don't know, it was 2000 or 201, and uh, Tushin said, I protested him in 1975, <laughs> and by God, and I said, Tushin, you're in the hospital. He was going through a tough time. He said, I'll protest him in a wheelchair. <laughs> uh, Another time he was handing out the State Street Poetry Sheet, that wonderful sheet that he produced, on, uh, at a concert on the square. And a, uh, somebody from the Arts Board, I think, uh, didn't know who he was, and, and came up and said, you can't do that here. And he said, yeah, I can. <laughs> they said, are you a nonprofit? And he said, well, no, but I'm broke. <laughs> Paul asked me to tell a, a story that I did relate in the column, but it, it, is, it is a pretty good one, and, and it, it probably has gotten better with every telling, but so what. Um, and it, it had to do when Tushin was out, um, somehow wandered west of Park Street, and was on, uh, <laughs> went into the, a used bookstore um, that I'll identify only as uh, half price books on Whitney Way. <laughs> and found a, his book, Tushin Etrix, uh, been prominent display in, the, in, the ca in a case where they had some, you know, their, their most prominent stuff. And he was happy, of course, and he, but he looks down and he sees that the price tag is $250. <laughs> and started to make inquiries and the poor young clerk didn't, you know, know and, and she muttered something about maybe that uh, she thought the Pope was local and she thought he was dead. <laughs> and, and said he was pretty sure the poet wasn't dead. And a manager eventually was called, and he was asked to produce some identification, Tushin, and of course he had none. And uh, he left being pretty sure they didn't believe that he was who he said he was. He did find a lot of humor in that. He called some friends around the country that night, and then some of them were pretty upset that, uh, um, you know, stranger in his own land sort of thing. But we got, he and I both got a lot of mileage out of that story and I think it was okay. Um, I, uh, I wanted to write one last column with him. I, uh, did, I have a pretty good job, not least of which is being edited by Ron McCray. Um, but a few months ago, the paper reprinted a column I did on absinthe, the, the banned liquor. Um, and I'd always, always wanted to try it. And darned if a reader um, about three weeks ago didn't come to show up at the paper and, and buzz for me. And I came downstairs and she gave me a little bottle that she'd gotten in Czechoslovakia of absinthe. And, you know, this is a momentous occasion. I'm thinking, you know, who, who should I have this with? And then it came to me, I'm serious, if, you know, two weeks ago there's one guy who I should have this with, you know, Paris, Hemingway. And, uh, I never did get around to making that phone call, and now it's uh, not going to happen. But uh, rather than mope about it, I do think that um, when a writer or an artist, and Tushin was both, certainly, 
leaves, he's gone, but he's not gone. And, and um, there's the writing, and some of it's kind of hard to find. And so I'm going to sort of throw the gauntlet down to everybody here, and I'll be willing to be the point person. But I certainly think that there's a great collection um, to be published of the poems and of some of the prose and maybe some reminiscences, reminiscences by uh, people here. Um, I think we could probably sell it for less than 250 bucks. <laughs> and, uh, and I think it would be great. And uh, I'm going to keep at it on my column, and we'll get it done. And, uh, Everyone can get together at the launch party for that. Okay. So many of you who are here this evening, I too met Tuchin um, in 1969 during Madison's turbulent and artistic era. Several years later, he stayed with me at my apartment above Hill's Grocery on East Dayton. Some of you remember this curious, funky little building. At this time, he had just returned from Paris, and he was trying to find his place in the local landscape. As many of you remember, uh, John pursued a lot of skirts in those days. <laughs> and we decided to exchange a rocky bed for a long-term friendship that lasted over 35 years. This friendship has included a great soul search for us both a profound love that's included poetry, psychoanalysis, jail time, jazz, politics, money, arguments, family concerns, cigarettes, and Jack Daniels. It's been punctuated with tremendous creativity and the wisdom of the Buddhas. Our relationship was generous, emotional, it was honest, and always courageous. Together we explored a psychic understanding that lovingly brought us together, often in mysterious and spiritual ways. For me, this could have happened with no one but Tushin. <clears throat> While he promoted my poetry, that's really just a fraction of how he enhanced my life. Now, in uh, 1998, following arrest in a Milwaukee hospital, Tushin decided to organize a poetry reading at Mother Fools. Uh, together with Jean-Marc, my marvelous husband, we titled the event Seducing Madness. We wanted something that sounded a little crazy, but also sexy. John was in great form. Many of you were there. He had emerged from the hospital with new energy, and he was riding on the love of all the nurses and staff who had fallen for his charm. He was on top of the scene, <laughs> keeping the ink wet. That was one of his favorite expressions. <laughs> it's still running out. It was a great night. There was standing room only, people spilling out of the doors. It was February, cold and icy. That night, I read a tribute to him, one that I'd been deeply inspired to write. I read it for him, he loved it, and he sent it to his friends. And he kept it on the desktop of his computer where it flashed repeatedly with his collection of favorite photos and memorabilia. So I'd like to share it with you tonight. <clears throat> After Paris. 
after Paris, it was difficult to reinvent yourself. Though the stitches of Madame Dufarge knit into her scarf marked tyrants for execution, you were fated to unravel into a pattern of psychic discontent and turmoil. Set aside on the fringe, you watched Midwestern mediocrity smother a people cloaked in nostalgia. The devil was on the wind. Armored in your leather jacket, you took to the streets, only to find the avenues too straight and narrow, the parks too crowded with dogs, led by pedigreed owners, all with predictable papers, signed by a bureaucrat, sealing our fate. Haunts of the night whispered dreams of romance, where flashes and flesh tunnel through love under a bridge, rotting with age. <clears throat> Visions held call, held call girls lining the mirrors, faded tubes of lipstick. They melted to your touch, smearing your fingers long after their scent rolled on. Behind the quaintness of each picket fence, neon tubes boxed banality flickering the street new flickering the news of Wall Street and Main Street, our town, not yours. Drugged with the boredom of shopping mall landscapes, you toasted a memory to Montparnasse, strewing spent bottles on each manicured lawn, cursing the nightmare, exposing the lie. Friends from the old days seemed distant and vague, paralyzed with the dread of times yet to come. Barker still growled, and Rupe dressed in black. The poets were howling, tormented <coughs> and sad. From the waiting, the dullness, the rules of the game that read like monopoly, pawns circling a square. As the wind pierced through your days and nights, you struggled to discover a time that fulfilled, that lingered in beauty at the edge of the world, where shadows slipped off the map and were scorched by the sun. To begin a new journey, uncharted yet certain, a lonely adventure destined toward home. Juggling potions too lethal for mortals to taste, you swallowed elixirs and toxins alike. Alchemical madness in search of the gold, transforming, transmuting, the base and debased, exacting each measure to balance the scale. <coughs> in this theater of cruelty, you sought to give voice to the darkness and demons the censors despise. Demanding the dreamers awake from their sleep, see how ghosts <coughs> and their hunger gnaw at the core. Like Arton in his trench coat, black wings blown to flight, you will rage at the devil, keep the angel in sight.
very recent friend of Dushan, just seven years. So I don't have a lot to tell you tonight, um, except one thing. I think with Dushan, there was one thing really important, and it was the truth. You cannot mess with a man like this. He had uh, something to share also with, uh, with Rambo. There was a telephone number. Uh, when the time was difficult and he cannot afford to pay his bill, he had to change his name for have a new telephone and a new email for communicate with his people. So he used Paul Verlaine, Arthur Rambo, and some other name I suppose that I don't know. And uh, it is some that I have read one poem of Rambo one time in public and he wants to listen that. And uh, two weeks ago, he was telling me he was ready to go to Spring Green, where we live, and to read something if I read the rainbow for him. So I will make it tonight in French. The poem is the Battle Eve, that's the drunken boat, and all the genius of the uh, Arthur Rambo, who is 17 when he write that, is to say, uh, to use I for talking about the boat. So we really identify with a poet all the time, and at the end of the poem, we just flip flop and turn us, um, tell him he's just a kid that's playing with a, with a paper boat that we have been very far away before. <coughs> Le bateau ivre. Comme je descendais des fleuves impassibles, je ne me sentis plus guidé par les halleux. Des peaux rouges criards les avaient pris pour cible, les ayant cloués nus au poteau de couleur. J'étais insoucieux de tous les équipages, porteurs de blé flamand et de cotons anglais. Quand, avec mes halleurs, on finit cet appage, les fleuves m'ont laissé descendre où je voulais. Dans les clapotements furieux des marées, moi, L'autre hiver, plus sourd que les cerveaux d'enfants, je courus, et les péninsules des marines n'ont pas su qui t'aurait eu plus triomphant. La tempête a béni mes éveils maritimes, plus léger qu'un bouchon, j'ai dansé sur les flots qu'on appelle rouleurs éternels de victimes. Dix nuits, ça regrettait l'œil miel des falots. Plus douce aux enfants, la chair des pommes sûres, l'eau verte pénétra ma coque de sapin, et des Tache de vin bleu et de vomissure me lava, dispersant gouvernail et grappe. Et dès lors, je me suis baigné dans le poème de la mer, infusé d'astres et lactescents, dévorant les azures verts, où flottaisons blême et ravi, un noyé pensif, parfois descend. Où, teignant, tout à coup les bleuités délire et les rythmes lents sous le rotulement du jour, plus forte que l'alcool, plus vaste que nos lits, fermente les rousseurs amères de l'amour. Je sais des cieux crevants en éclairs, et les trônes, et les ressacs, et les courants. Je sais le soir, l'eau exaltée, ainsi qu'un peuple de colombes, et j'ai vu quelquefois ce que l'homme a cru voir. J'ai vu le soleil bas, taché d'horreur mystique, illuminant de longs figements violets, Pareil à des acteurs de drame très antiques, les flots roulant au loin leurs frissons de poêlés. J'ai rêvé la nuit verte aux neiges éblouies, baiser longtemps aux yeux des mers avec lenteur, la circulation des sèves inouïes et l'éveil jaune et bleu des phosphores chanteurs. J'ai suivi des mois pleins, pareil aux vacheries hystériques, la houle à l'assaut des récifs, sans songer que les pieds lumineux des marées puis se forcer le mufle aux océans poussifs. J'ai heurté, savez-vous, l'incroyable Floride, mêlant aux fleurs des yeux de panthère à peau d'homme, des arcs-en-ciel tendus comme les brides sous l'horizon des mers au bloc trou. J'ai vu fermenter les marais énormes, nas ou pourrissent les joncs, tout un léviathan, de l'écroulement d'eau au milieu des bonasses et lointain vers les gouffres au Qatar. Glacier, soleil d'argent, fleuve d'accro, creux de braise, échoua de au fond des golfes bruns, 
où les serpents géants des forêts des punaises choix des arbres tordus avec de noirs parfums. J'aurais voulu montrer aux enfants ces dorades du flot bleu, ces poissons d'or, ces poissons chantants, des écumes de fleurs en baissée médérale et d'ineffablement montés élevés par, par instant. Parfois, martyrs lassés d'épauler des eaux, la mer dont le sanglot faisait mon bruit montait vers moi ses fleurs d'ombre au vent tous les jours, et je restais, ainsi qu'une femme, à genoux, presque ille, balottant sur mes bords les querelles et les fuyantes d'oiseaux clabodeurs aux yeux blonds, et je voguais lorsqu'à travers mes liens frêles des noyés descendaient dormir à recul. Or, moi, bateau perdu sous les cheveux des hanses, jeté par l'ouragan dans les terres sans oiseaux, moi, dont les moniteurs et les voiliers des hanses, n'aurais pas repêché la carcasse ivre d'eau, libre, fumant, montée de brumes violettes. Moi qui trouais le ciel rejoignant comme un mort, qui porte confiture esquise au bon poète, des lichens de soleil et des morts d'azur. Qui courait, taché de lunule électrique, planche folle, escorté des hippocampes noires, quand les juillets faisaient crouler à coups de trique les cieux ultramarins aux ardents entours. Moi, qui tremblais, sans ton jambe à cinquante lieues, le rude des béhemons et des maestros épais, fileur éternel des immobilités bleues, je regrette l'Europe aux anciens parapets. J'ai vu des archipels sidéraux et des îles dont les cieux délirants sont ouverts aux longueurs. Est-ce en ces nuits sans fond que tu dors et t'exiles, millions d'oiseaux d'or, ô futur vigueur mais vrai, j'ai trop pleuré. Les aubes sont avant, et toute lune est atroce, tout soleil amer. L'acre amour m'a gonflé de torpeurs enivrantes. Oh, que ma quille éclate, oh que j'aille à la mer. Si je désire une eau d'Europe, c'est la flash, noire et humide, ou vers le crépuscule embaumé, un enfant accroupi, plein de tristesse. Lâche un bateau frêle comme un papillon de mer. Je ne puis plus baigner de vos longueurs aux lames, enlever le sillage aux porteurs de coton, ni traverser l'orgueil des drapeaux et des flammes, ni nager sous les yeux horribles des pompons.
Rachel and I wanted to do the um, simple shaker hymn. Um, as all of the recognitions have emphasized, you should have a, a spirituality that was not about conventional religion. <coughs> but I think that um, the shaker hymn <coughs> speaks to him, speaks to us. <laughs> and we played it together when um, I had the honor in 2001, I did a compendium of poets all around southern Wisconsin. And Fusion and I were uh, the last season's worth of poets in um, the autumnal poets. And so for the CD release party, I had Angela play the, um, as a gift to be simple. Some of you may recognize it as the music that Aaron Copeland used and, um, and Martha Graham produced an extraordinary uh, ballet uh, modern dance piece, Appalachian Spring. And the words are, and when, when Angela starts to play, I encourage anyone who would like to, to sing along. It is a gift to be simple. It is a gift to be free. It is a gift to come around where we want to be. And when we are in the place that is just right, we will be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained to bow and to bend, we will not be ashamed. To turn and to turn <coughs> will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come. Sharon Kilfoy, and I believe that I am the last artist from the Gallery 853 era who still lives on Williamson Street. So I have known John since probably the late 60s, early 70s. I um, was married to Dan Yopak the person who founded Gallery 853, the Artist Research Workshop, the Willie Street Fair. And I was in and out of that venue. Um, one time when I had returned from Mexico, 
Daniel and I were separated and uh, I came back um, pregnant and stayed there at Gallery 853 and he cared for me and uh, with no judgment and Tushin and Sonny were living there at the time upstairs and Sonny was my birth coach. We produced a volume of poetry that she wrote and I illustrated together. And uh, Yopak bought me a lovely baby crib from St. Vincent's and gave me a ride home from the hospital. And it was Sonny and John who took me there. And uh, John would be the person who would answer the phone when I wasn't quite sure what was going on. And I'd say, John, I don't know if it's really time yet or not, but would you please go get Sonny for me? And Sonny would come, and sometimes they would both come over and check and see how I was doing. And uh, it was Sonny, though, who was there with me. And although Sonny and I um, did not always remain in contact. I did remain in contact with Tushin and would see him occasionally, um, sometimes more frequently than others. I ended up at the respite center caring for kids and there was a time when John actually ended up there too. He had gotten a degree in psychology and uh, was helping disabled people. He was a, a coach for them. And I think he was actually pretty proud at that time, that as, as I think we both were, that we had somewhat entered the mainstream. But um, we're doing it in a way that benefit other people and that uh, allowed us to continue to learn about what it means to be a human being. And as many of you, I'm sure, all of you who live here in Madison are aware, there's a tremendous development pressure right now in Williamson Street. And uh, what had been kind of funky and um, industrial and down home for those of us who frequented that area, it's now somehow or another become sort of uh, hip and uh, fashionable. And uh, it, I joined a group called the Friends of Historic Third Lake Ridge, mainly to oppose the development that's going on and have certainly learned a lot about preservation and decided that there's a lot to be said about that era back there that I think would benefit especially young people these days. That there's uh, something that was going on back in those days that I think is exemplified by that personal story that I told you. It's the reason that I shared those intimate details of my life with you because there was a, a, a camaraderie then and a, a support of each other um, and a closeness, but there was also an investigation into life itself. And um, I called, I, I thought that maybe what we should do is have a happening or I, I wasn't quite sure how to get back in touch with those days and also to sort of um, make what we knew instrumental to other people. And I called up Tushin and, and of course he said, well sure, I'll be part of anything you want to put together, Sharon. And we began to reminisce and he said, you know, whether we were artists or poets or political activists, what we shared was hope. That's what characterized that time for all of us. We were hopeful. And to me, I think that Tushin was not only very gifted with words, but he was able to get at the heart of things. He was an arrow who was able to hit the target he was able to describe the core 
and, uh, and, and, and that is a very special gift. Um, I saw him quite a bit recently. Uh, Dan Yopak had been back in town, had had a hip replaced, as uh, Tushin, of course, had had too, and so they would reminisce about that. Um, the last time we were all together, um, we were over at Dan's sister's house, and uh, I have to say, I think I must have insulted Tushin in some way. He just kind of left. And um, I never really did get that one cleared up with him. I'm not sure how exactly. I, I, I did leave a few messages that he never returned, but I think I'm going to have to just let that one go. And uh, Daniel, uh, of course, wanted to be here and has written um, quite a bit that he wanted to share. And I thought rather than you not only hearing my reminiscences about Tushin, but his as well, that um, John Martins, who I think many of us know and, and love from that era, is willing to come up and read Daniel Pack's tribute to Tushin. So, John? Uh, guess what? Two more poems. But um, I think with the Willie Street Shuffle and Absinthe and uh, Soulful Cello in French, I think we're doing it well here. Um, <clears throat> this is from Dan Yopak, uh, who is now Dan Raven Yopak. And um, Dan, who is a good friend of John's, or Tushin's, um, who has, uh, like all of us, have been shocked and moved by it. Uh, John's passing and um, this is a poem that came in hot off the fax machine this morning from Dan <clears throat> dear John Tushin this is a parting letter but not a dear John letter in the form of a poem because you have so emblazoned yourself on my spirit and who I am your successes and your failures are part of me and part of all humanity. We are all connected. For me, I have worked hard to find my personal passion, and yours has always been that as a teacher. Your failures were just as important as your successes because they helped to define who you were and how you might express yourself. And that you did, expressing yourself with commitment and integrity successfully becoming the sage that you were meant to be. Since I heard of your departure, I experienced through my memories the wind walkers singing your song. They are our ancestors who are like a choir whose task it is to express the emotions of the earth, our mother, in Native American tradition. We see them all, quite clearly, watching as they manipulate the clouds to create ever-changing messages, as if an ongoing watercolor or a poem. These ever-emerging, billowing cocoons, where air and water become visible and begin to separate, allowing the water molecules to become raindrops who grow heavy enough and return to earth. Tushin, you became that ain't that raindrop who has now grown heavy enough and has fallen back to earth. Your memory is like a rainstorm where wind walkers are visible again, expressing adequately the mother's emotions from subtle to extreme. We have seen your rainbows, my brother, many times and love you for creating them. Your friend and brother, Dan Raven Yopak. 
Dan goes on to say that John Tushin published his first work other than works he had published himself. Um, it was a, a short poem titled Rooting for a Weed that John handed out in his inspirational street sheet. And he uh, told Dan that this poem he felt reflected him himself. It's called Rooting for a Weed, dedicated to the memory of John Tushin. Do you know what I love? I love to root for that plant, probably a weed, who has the strength and audacity to push through concrete into the air world, a protester of sorts, a kind of leftist radical of the plant world, an underdog, Someone you would probably never take home to mom. <laughs> Though I uh, knew Tushin over 30 years, I'm absolutely stunned and surprised that no one, uh, what, Fesh Mass uh, 602 Club, huh? Uh, first time I met him at the 602 Club, he, uh, I was behind the bar tending and it was packed five deep. That was from the time when the drinking age was 18 on a Thursday night. And in the middle of this packed place, he cold cocked some guy in the middle of, you know, thanks, Tushin. <laughs> The last few years, he and I became somewhat closer, only because working at Rainbow Bookstore, I lived around, the, uh, I worked around the corner from where he was living in that little box of a place up on State Street. So he would call me, especially after he got, well, when he was still over in the, in the nursing home, recovering from his uh, hip replacement, and then uh, run around the corner, stop what I'm doing, no matter what it was in the store, call up, okay, Tushin, I'll be right over, drop the keys out the window, get the money, run and get the cigarettes get the key, open the door, you know. Last time we did an event, a Tushin event at the Rainbow Bookstore, he didn't show up. <laughs> and I saw him the next day and he says, well, I was here at seven o'clock and no one was here. I said, Tushin, the event was at eight. He says, it was? I said, yeah, you made the poster. <laughs> <laughs> so at that time, at the time I said, Tushin, you know, you really, you're really a Luftmensch. <coughs> and he said, what's, what's a Luftmensch? And I said, a Luftmensch has many meanings. It's an old Yiddish term that means, as some, somebody can say like, ah, that Luftmensch. Or, what it really means, literally, a man in the clouds, an ear man, Luftmensch. Meaning, meaning that this was a tradition of this old kind of itinerant wandering bards and spiritual minds and, and secular wise men who would go throughout Eastern Europe from town to town, settlement to settlement, and be supported by the communities. They lived on air. No visible means of support, but there was always somebody there with a pack of cigarettes or a bottle of whatever or food or nourishment and they would impart their wisdom, you know, true bards. And I explained that to Tushin, he said, Rav, Tushin, Rav, Tushin, Rav, you're right. <laughs> In honor of uh, Tushin, I want to draw from a very great uh, contemporary Jewish uh, poetess, Thank you. <laughs> a uh, great feminist, radical Jewish poet. <laughs> a, uh, a noted, very significant voice now in national, international circles. A survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto who was smuggled out and saved, smuggled out of the Warsaw Ghetto in a, pit, in a large picnic basket and survived her father a uh, militant 
of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Her name is Irina Klepfish, and she lives in New York now. She wrote this poem called Bashert. Now, Bashert is translated oftentimes as uh, the inevitable, uh, predestined. I like to call it a uh, happenstance. Bashert. These words are dedicated to those who died. These words are dedicated to those who died because they had no love and felt alone in the world because they were afraid to be alone and tried to stick it out because they could not ask because they were shunned because they were sick and their bodies could not resist the disease because they played it safe because they had no connections because they had no faith because they felt they did not belong and wanted to die these words are dedicated to those who died because they were loners and liked it because they acquired friends and drew others to them, because they took risks, because they were stubborn and refused to give up, because they asked for too much. These words are dedicated to those who died because a card was lost and a number was skipped, because a bed was denied, because a place was filled and no other place was left. These words are dedicated to those who died because someone did not follow through, because someone was overworked and forgot, because someone left everything to God, because someone was late, because someone did not arrive at all, because someone told them to wait and they just couldn't wait any longer. These words are dedicated to those who died because death is a punishment, because death is a reward, because death is the final rest, because death is eternal rage. These words are dedicated to those who died the shirt. These words are dedicated to those who survived. These words are dedicated to those who survived because their second grade teacher gave them books. Because they did not draw attention to themselves and got lost in the shuffle because they knew someone who knew someone else who could help them and bumped into them on a corner on a Thursday afternoon because they played it safe, because they were lucky. These words are dedicated to those who survived because they knew how to cut corners, because they drew attention to themselves and always got picked, because they took risks, because they had no principles and were hard. These words are dedicated to those who survived because they refused to give up and defied statistics, because they had faith and trusted in God, because they expected the worst and were always prepared, because they were angry, because they could ask because they mooched off others and saved their strength, because they endured humiliation, because they turned the other cheek, because they looked the other way. These words are dedicated to those who survived because life is a wilderness and they were savage, because life is an awakening and they were alert, because life is a flowering and they blossomed, because life is a struggle Life is a struggle, and they struggle because life is a gift, and they were free to accept it. These words are dedicated to those who survived, for sure.
she also she wanted to me to say also that she she wishes she could be here and she honors my father not only as a poet but as a human and as a father and as a beautiful human being. She's very glad to have known. I walk alone. Along the street at night, sometimes the rain is bodyless, deja vu, random street, the rain's velvet scream. Almost the whisper of your voice as I remember your elegant fingers in the flare of a match. As we paused on the edge of that illusion that now rises from the dead, that returns years from then without warning, on this dark street where I stand transfixed, embraced, but only by the wind. Her daughter also, Phoebe Stone, um, was very important to my father. I couldn't make it today. singing for millennia before it was writing, and that I think John understood that, and John's um, uh, commitment to doing music with his poetry was an indication that he understood that poets are singers as much as they are writers. And uh, before doing the two short pieces I have, I came up with over this last week since, I, since Andrea told me he died. I just want to honor John because I feel he is fundamentally a braver poet than I've ever been able to be. Uh, John believed, and I've heard it echoed here this evening, that um, poets were every bit as important in any given community as butchers, bakers, or candlestick makers, and that with that conviction, he felt that the community should be able to support uh, their poets, and he lived a, quite frankly, very marginal existence as a poet in this community, uh, and lived a lifestyle I wasn't willing to surrender myself to, even though I had been sort of indigent bohemian in my early 20s. By the time I got to Madison, I had enough of that. Some of you know what I do for a living, and I've you know, moved on and done different things. But I'd like to read two short, or do a song and a poem for John if I might. Uh, there's one word in this poem I think many of you here know, but to the few of you that don't, I refer to, I refer to John as a flaneur. And a flaneur is a, a term I believe Baudelaire coined or used, which means in French either idler or stroller. And Baudelaire used it in the sense of a awakened observer of the social scene and uh, sort of an original bohemian. And uh, John was uh, Certainly a great, great flaneur. Oh, Eric, this is a flaneur moves on for John. 
O'Air, Baudelaire, great State Street poet, when your beloved son scatters the last of your worn out overcoat from the Eiffel Tower, your ghost will coast along both those famous Parisian boulevards and the lesser known streets of this prairie city. Oh, true beat poet amongst us, when these heartfelt accolades fade away, your smile, your laugh, even the tongue-tied lilt of your voice will live on as long as your love songs to our collective lives and times. So coast on now, John. Go join the other poets of the Bardo. And I'd like to finish with a, a song. That's a poem I wrote for him after Andrea called me. And then this song, the song in some ways is more appropriate because it just sort of showed up out of nowhere. And the real stuff always shows up out of nowhere. This is your stuttering song, if I can get through it. I was always kind of amazed towards the end that John wanted me to teach him to play the guitar because uh, with my, as you'll hear in a moment, my idiot sublime <laughs> guitar style, <laughs> I couldn't imagine he wanted me as a teacher, but he was very gracious about it, and I, you know, anyway. Somehow, I'll never hear you call my name out loud again. Save the time for crazy blame, but toward the end we just ran down different roads, that's all. Oh God. I really miss your stuttering song. I waited at those readings to the wall. Those scenes will never be the same somehow. I'll never hear you recite your latest poems to a boisterous crowd. This ain't the time for dropping names. Paths were different, but oh, that does But John, I'm really gonna miss you stuttering song. As I waited those greetings to go on. Thank you. Wow, uh, Lou and, and Peter Berryman come up to close us out. I just like to share some final, some final thoughts with you. Um, in the 1970s, uh, up in the mayor's office, it seemed that we were always careening from one <coughs> self-inflicted wound to another. Um, the, it, I mean, e e either, either Phil Ball, without consulting with anyone, would announce publicly we were going to rename Mifflin Street, King James <laughs> Trail. Or I'll never forget the day that one of my assistants asked me to step into the office and shut the door to tell me as we were approaching election, an election that was four months away, that not one but two of the unmarried women uh, in our office were both going to be expecting in about four or five months. Um, then there was the, the arts program with, with help from people like Mary Berryman Agard and, and, and John Dushan, we came up with this very simple idea. We're going to fund local artists. The only requirement is they be local and that their work be free to the public. And so we put together a program in the first year. We funded about a dozen of them. I had envisioned uh, somebody playing an instrument on the square, uh, reading a book <laughs> to 
to a child in a school, uh, creating something original and sharing it. And of course, Tushin was selected as one of the poets to be funded, which was not an issue or a problem. His public presentation was at Oakwood <coughs> Lutheran Home for the Elderly. <laughs> They absolutely loved them. <laughs> the raves and the reviews were just, just incredible. Uh, as we went into the 1970s and came out of it, uh, John and I spent a lot of time at, at the Cardinal Bar. And I, I don't want to go into much detail about that, <laughs> except that Occasionally, I would interrupt our, our conversation by just walking out on him because there were women who wanted to dance, and I frankly thought that that was more fun at times than talking to John, which of course sometimes led to his anger. As I look around the room, and I think about all the people he offended over the years, I'm pleased to see that more than half of them have showed up here for this, this, this memorial this evening. As we got into the early 1980s, <coughs> John began to mature. Um, he would no longer jump off the bridge over the Ahar River by Marquette School and show up on my doorstep soaking away at 2 in the morning. <laughs> but it was another 15 years. It was another 15 years before the, the 2 a.m. phone calls would finally that. Um, the, the, the heart of Tushin, I think, was his, his inspiration, his, his demand that all of his friends some way express themselves, whether it be through writing or speaking or a musical instrument or chalk on the sidewalk, he simply could not tolerate the notion that someone had something to say and they contained it. And he firmly believed that everyone had something to say. The last few years, I had a regular meeting on Monday nights and sometime around 6.30, 7.30, uh, depending on the Monday, Tushin and I would get together for a drink someplace and we'd go through this ritual of uh, him pulling out his wallet and I buying both drinks. <laughs> um, he talked a lot, awful lot about you, Jordan. Um, I think you, you need to know that. That's, you, you can't imagine how he would uh, insist upon sharing his pride about your accomplishments and what you were doing. And Sonny, I don't know what your relationship was. <laughs> I, I mean, the affection with which he, he spoke of you and, and your relationship and the beauty that came from Jordan um, was, was endless. And there's, there's stories I, I heard more than once. Uh, And sometimes, by the way, he didn't show up on those Monday nights. And I guess there's several of us who had appointments with him that he didn't keep. But I have to tell you what I did last Sunday night after Sonny called me. Because it has some bearing to Doug Moe's story. I had recently been looking for some books online about gangsters and searching, um, searching the out of print book sites on the internet. And so I immediately went to see what was available under Tushin's name. And I found about five or six books, uh, three copies of uh, Tushin Etrics and one copy of the book he edited and another copy or two of the other book that I can't remember now. Anyway, yes. For those of you who've got any thoughts of getting them, I 
can tell you right now that I absolutely refused to pay $250 for John's books. So the two that were listed at $250 are still available. <laughs> but I did buy the cheaper versions. I sat there and I went through my computer and I looked it up and I got it to the site, put it in my uh, shopping cart, and then I just walked away and I left. I didn't buy it. I came back an hour later, did the same thing. And then I had to go through this thought process. I said, why are you buying this? The first thing that ran through my mind was that if I get copies for $30 and $50 and not $250, I could resell them <laughs> and recoup some of the alcohol charges <laughs> over the years. The next thought was that uh, I was buying them uh, because I wanted to have them. So it didn't matter how many copies you have. And the last reason, which I really came to when I finally hit the purchase plus button, I'm not sure why I bought them, but I just needed to have them. And that's what I think Tushin did to us. Uh, no matter what part of him he himself that he shared with us. He created a need in all of us to spend time with him and to take inspiration from him and to find whatever it was in us that we needed to express. So, just a reminder that we'll be gathering as late as it is at the east side. Business Persons Association. <laughs> um, <coughs> there are copies of today's isthmus uh, on the table over there with a beautiful piece that Fred Milverstadt wrote. Uh, and of course, Fred, to make sure that isthmus published it, came down for sure in the ring on the covers. So. <laughs> so, thank you all very much for coming on behalf of Jordan, Sonny, and Daniel. I just want to uh, agree with Paul and with what Hannibal said in his email and so on about how valuable it is for people like us who are struggling to make their way in the art world in one way or another, to have somebody like Tushin who, no matter if you're having an argument with him or you weren't at the time, he would always, without wavering, uh, urge you to continue being creative and, uh, to, uh, and, and show as an example that it's possible, even if you have to mooch a certain number of cigarettes to do it or whatever, but it's possible to live your life that way based on creativity. So. It, that kind of thing is extremely valuable, and we're going to do our song about. He, he was sort of the the Mr. Rogers of the you know the art world for us, encouraging us to to believe in to believe in ourselves just as we are. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. It's our song about about gratitude. It could have been Mercury.
Thank you.